Hi everyone and welcome to this episode of the Fret Success Guitar Show. This week I have got Simon Pellet. He actually runs his own podcast called the Music on Your Own Terms podcast. I wanted to interview him because he's got quite a varied experience in guitar playing, guitar teaching and his own running his own podcast and has some interesting stories to tell. Uh, so hi Simon, how are you doing? I'm good, how are you? I'm not too bad. Um, but yeah, no, thanks for coming on the show. Um, I wanted to touch on a few things that you've been doing, quite a varied thing. You, you were based in England yourself um, and you moved across to the States and have been here for the past, well, 20 years, I think it is. Yeah, so you've been playing a long time since you were like 11 years old. So I'd like to touch a bit on that and your story of everyone's different when they've been playing the guitar, how they kind of picked it up, uh, why they picked it up, who inspired them. So maybe give you free roam to kind of chat a bit about that, really. Sure. Um, so... I mean, my earliest memories, um, you know, everyone has, um, you know, ha has influenced by probably Queen and, and some of the uh, cla more classic rock, especially in England, the British uh, bands. I mean, my parents always played Queen. My dad had a fairly varied record collection. You know, he's into Clapton and stuff like that. Um, I mean, my earliest memory of actually wanting to play was... Uh, was seeing Brian Adams. Um, I forget which video it was, but I saw um, his guitar player, his lead guitar player, had a red strat and long hair, and I thought that looked cool. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, I I don't remember exactly asking for for guitar lessons that I can remember, but um, it, you know, it's it's ten, eleven years old. It's a bit of a blur, but I, I do remember my dad coming home with a mixtape of Satriani. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and then uh, one of my neighbors um, came around with a guitar he was learning as well, and he brought the Black Album and Countdown to Extinction and uh, started to get me hooked into, you know, the metal side. Um, but, yeah, I'd say influence-wise uh, early on was probably like Brian May and Mark Knopfler and Clapton that my dad was listening to, and then I just started getting into the heavier stuff from there. Um, yeah, I guess that's kind of interesting because... Uh... Well, Brian May was voted, was it the best guitarist or something? He picked Jimmy to the top for some reason. And I think it was Guitar Magazine or, or Guitar.com. People have voted it. So he's quite a good person to inspire. And I like the way he talks about the instrument. I quite mm -hmm. like his passion. He's very uh, soothing to listen to in that way. So I can understand that. So how did that then develop from there as that initial kind of musings, touching on classic rock and metal? Did you kind of focus on Satriani and metal? Was that your main focus from then on then? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I don't, I don't really remember, um, necessarily focusing on anything in particular for playing. Um, but I know that, you know, as I started getting into more heavier music, more technical music, dream theater played a huge role and, you know, Devin Townsend and, and, you know, I started to watch MTV headbangers ball, um, and within the space of a couple of years, I was, you know, full on death metal mode. And um, for any, I mean, I wasn't necessarily just into death metal, I was into Prague, I was into, you know, I really like flamenco players and I, I pick up bits here and there. But I think Satriani and Paul Gilbert were probably my two biggest guitar influences. And then Petrucci started getting in there and I started getting into the little shred guys. Um, you know, and, and it just, I just heard all this stuff back and forth and, you know, um, I could never do any of it. You know, I was, <laughs> I was kind of limited at that point playing Ugly Kid Joe and, uh, and some of the, the slower stuff. But, but then I say that and I've used like the Erotomania, uh, Dream Theater instrumental off of Awake, that intro riff, which is like a. I forget what time signature in, it's in, but I started using that as a warm up, just mm -hmm. because it's it's got weird time signatures and it's just a nice chromatic riff to warm up yeah. with. And I I would use you know I would I bought all the VHS tapes like uh, Paul Gilbert's Intense Rock One and Two, Terrifying Guitar Trip, John Petrucci's VHS, and I just I just watched them. I wouldn't necessarily follow. I, I picked up a few of the you know exercises and whatnot, but I would kind of watch them as entertainment, hoping that, you know, I would actually get better by osmosis. 
it's interesting really because in that time, I was a similar time to what I was learning, is that there wasn't this kind of YouTube, the the kind of guidance yeah. online. It was very much this VHS or a book, mm-hmm. or you were very much on your own if you didn't go to a teacher. So it's interesting. I mean, I even looked at the things like, you know, the Satch tapes were one of those things that I looked mm-hmm. at and consumed and necessarily didn't. So I didn't necessarily learn much from them. I was just, like you're saying, consuming them, hoping that they would influence me in some kind of way. And they, and they did. I mean, those guys that you mentioned, you know, Gilbert and uh, Petrucci and, and uh, those guys, they're, they're definitely some of the most influential, inspirational guitar players. And because they focus solely on guitar, I think it's it's very infectious and it just mm-hmm. sprout a certain kind of guitar player from that where you become more technically minded and more into that stuff. Do you find you still go back to that kind of st- stuff listening wise or are you kind of in a different place now? Oh no, I've I've always listened to Search. I've always listened to Vi- uh, to Paul Gilbert, uh, Dream mm. Theater, kind of, I've, I, I dropped off of Dream Theater a little bit as, you know, Portnoy left and, you know, they, to me, they kind of got a little more uh, predictable. Um, yeah. But that being said, yeah, like, I mean, you're 14, 15, 16 years old. That's your formative years. And I think there's a lot um, of stuff that sticks around with you just because you're developing your tastes, your mind, and it, it's like a fondness in your mind. So um, there's a lot of stuff I really like from that era uh, that I still listen to. Um, like, like, for instance, uh, Steve Vai I went to see several times. And I still listen to here and there, but Steve Vai is not one that I listen to all the time now. Whereas, uh, you know, the, the first half of Dream Theater, I still listen to. Um, Satriani, Paul Gilbert, I still listen to. I mean, it depends. I've, I've kind of, in, in terms of uh, instrumental guitar, I've definitely matured in my listening habits as much as I like people like... Um, you know, Eric Johnson, I've always liked, but uh, mm. Brian, not Brian, um, Nick Johnston is is a Canadian guitar player. I really like his playing. Uh, Andy Wood. Um, oh, who's who, Doug Rappaport? Like he, in yeah. terms of his phrasing and his, his vocabulary, he's one of my favorite guitar players right now just because he's so... You know, he's, he's really at the cusp of feel playing, even though he shreds. Um, I think that's a great place that we're at at the moment, is that these players are starting to move away and been inspired like you have by these, you know, fundamental guys like your Vise and such and Gilbert. And Gilbert's still around and he's changed his sound. He's the only guy really that I'm kind of keeping up to date and thinking his new stuff's really good. Like he's changing the way he's doing stuff and he's adapting. He's not just going for the kind of shred. So I think we're in a good place now where people are starting to push and get a bit more lyrical with their phrasing. And I think that's what you're kind of getting at. Yeah, I mean, that's that's what I'm I'm kind of into. I still like people like Animals as, as leaders and like we sure yeah. started off that gent phase and you have all those technical gent players that are in that kind of niche. Like I, I like Andy James is one of them. Those kind of uh, yeah. you know gent shred players are kind of their own animal. I think um, the only thing that turns me off about that kind of not 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 individual players but the scene itself is kind of the over processed guitar sound. I'm definitely yeah. more of a fan of the the organic amp sound, which players like you know Andy Wood and Nick Johnston have. Definitely mm-hmm. Doug Rappaport. I mean, the guy has all the amps that he's testing. Um, on his channel, but yeah, I'm just I'm just more of a, a natural sounding guitar versus the overprocessed sound. Yeah, no, I I'm in that court as well, um, and I love the way things are being pushed. Modeling is unreal compared to how it was even five ten years ago. Um, mm-hmm. The way it's come on leaps and bounds, but I don't think there's anything that will replace that kind of amps amp sound especially valve amp sound I, I love this sound i like the noise I, I like the way it feeds back the kind of the way you can make the amp work in different ways making it bounce and react but i find still modeling is very much going for that clean perfect sound and they're starting to do more of the modeling of like retro amps but it's it, it doesn't sound the same but i can understand the convenience of it because you just plug it in and it's the same every time you don't have to maintain it you know my amp's got like 12 valves in it you don't you have to yeah. replace them every two three years and it's quite an expense, so I can completely understand and hope we get there. Um, 
but they have a place i think and maybe not in the kind of the, the way that we use you know traditional amps for so what's sure. your kind of go-to amp then what what do you use and my most fond of um sitting behind me is my uh prs mt15 um nice. that's been my go-to amp since i got it uh below mm-hmm. that i've got my uh, carbon v3 which mm-hmm. has a great sound to it um i just i it, it take it's one of those amps that it, it I wouldn't say it has a bad sound per se, but there's definitely areas of the range of, of sounds when you dial it in um, that aren't great. But when you get it yeah. to that spot, it's, 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 it's really a good amp. Um, the, the thing about the PRS is it does not have a bad sound on it. Like You can <laughs> plug in, you just whack the controls wherever at random, and it'll still sound good. Um, I mean, if I move out the way, my old rig... I just drop this down. Um, so, TV Classic 5050 old shoe power amp and my Boss GT Pro. So, that was my live rig for a long time. Um, and, you know, I could get every sound out of it I needed at the time. Um, oh, and it, it really never let me down. This, this uh, PV amp, I bought that when I was, uh, I think, 19 years old. It came on the plane to the U.S. and I didn't change. It's it's fallen over several times, and I didn't change the tubes until about uh, three years ago, and it was running mm-hmm. strong. Like that thing mm-hmm. is an absolute tank. It's a great amp. Um, yeah. And then I finally decided to change. It was a, it's a British um, version, so it had the two twenty um, power uh, power um, transformer on mm-hmm. it. And, yeah, and I yeah. had a step down, a uh, step down transformer, so I could use, I could use it over here, um, which means I was lugging three different transformers around with me. So finally, I I got off my butt and actually decided to get it converted. So that's US power yeah. now. Um, but yeah, that um, the reason I stopped using that. I mean, I don't really play live anymore anyway because I'm more I'm more focused on studio work, but. Um, when I started getting into heads, um, I just found that the, the sound I was getting out of the boss, although it's, it's an amazing unit for what it is. Um, I just started really hearing that, um, you know, the digital overtones and and all those artifacts that you don't really like. So especially as soon as I got the PRS, um, I found myself really starting to get into, um, you know, pedals and, doing, you know, going one by one with each pedal, plugging it in and saying, all right, does this work with this amp? And then putting two together and just, you know, really analyzing what sounds go with what pedal. And if a pedal doesn't work, then, I, you know, it, it's gone. Makes more sense to me to do that because I think there's definitely a habit that people get with these multi effects pedals where it's just like, oh, I'm sorted, it's done. But then, mm-hmm. I don't know, I think it's better to have like two or three pedals that you really love using and try and figure out how that works for you. And then just like, if you get fed up with that pedal, just sell it and get a new one. Because they, they tend to retain the value quite well if you, especially if you buy like a secondhand used unit, I mean, which is, you know, easy to do now. You wait like six months and people are always doing this sort of thing. So I think the you the individual pedal thing for me is more my preference, really. Uh, so you mentioned that you aren't really much of a live player anymore and you focus on studio work, but I imagine you've been through that process before and played live. So I'd like to dig into a bit more about that. And I know you've been in a few bands, um, but I, th- I, re- I recall you saying uh, when we've had a bit of correspondence before that you were in a band called uh, Angry Octopus um, and I, you had some reasonable success with that, playing with like touring acts and uh, yeah. th- things were starting to happen, but then you started to fall out and stuff. So I'd love to know a bit about that process, what it was like playing for a live touring app, what you had to do preparation wise and that sort of thing. Um, I mean, actually just to go back a little bit further. Um, so I, I very, I'm very perfectionist and, um, you know, I, I, I talk about this on my podcast and I'm, uh, have social anxiety of suffer from depression. Um, so mm-hmm. there was a period of time where I really, wasn't focusing too much on guitar. Um, I was I was still learning. I was still trying to figure out playing, you know, 
Dream Theater riffs and all this other stuff, but it it got to the point where I'm like, I'm not John Petrucci. I've got to practice more. Oh, I really want to get out playing live, but I'm not good enough because I'm not John Petrucci. And just <laughs> it was like a vicious cycle. So it took me answering an ad. Uh, somebody somebody actually uh, said, do you want to play in a, a Black Sabbath cover band as a bass player? And I'm like, sure. I didn't have a bass. So I practiced for about, I don't know, five days, uh, a couple of songs and got the gig. And then I, I, I just jammed with a couple of guys in a basement for, you know, six months or so. And that didn't really go anywhere as much as live. But um, what it got me doing is just playing with other musicians again. Um, yeah. and, when, and then I found uh, an ad that said, you know, we're looking for a guitar player um, to play live. Here's the EP. And I answered the ad and I went, I took a few weeks to learn the, um, learn the material. Um, actually that the funny part was that that was the first week I actually came down to Texas to visit for the first time. Uh, my mm -hmm. wife worked, you know, worked down here, um, to travel. Um, and that, that week was the week that I was listening to it on the plane and, and going over it in my head. Um, and the material was, um, you know, fairly technical. I mean, it, it's, it's almost like, uh, kind of a breaking Benjamin type sound yep. almost um you know fairly heavy some good uh good solos um and so yeah i ended up getting the gig and then off we we kind of rehearsed for a couple of months and then we were offered a gig um opening up for uh tantric which was the uh, 90s band um mm -hmm. you know uh breakdown was their their biggest hit so yep. we opened up for them um and that that you know, it's on YouTube. You can find that. Um, funny story about that is uh, one song we tuned slightly differently, and I had a clip on tuner on my guitar. So we get to that song, and we'd been told absolutely no audible tuning because it's unprofessional, don't do it. Sure. And so I went to hit my tuner, and it flicked off and, and hit the middle of the stage and went down into the stage blocks. So what I could have done is just turned around, turned my power amp off or turned it down and used my, the tuner on the boss unit. But, you know, cause I was very nervous. I didn't think about it. So yep. I ended up taking my guitar off, getting down face down on the staging, found the tuner. It was still on lap. Thankfully, otherwise I'd never have seen it. Got off, tuned the guitar and went on with the gig. But, um, you know, it's kind of one of those stupid things that, you, you know, you get so nervous and, you know, in the moment that you don't think clearly. After no, that, definitely. End, yeah. I ended up getting my uh, my rack tuner, my Borg unit. Behind me. <laughs> um, you learned your I lesson. Yeah. That again. Um, but the, actually, the other the other thing that um, stands out with that gig is that the uh, and I've I think I've talked about this on my podcast before, but the uh, the sound guy um, does a lot of bit, the one of the big venues in New Hampshire one of the big mm -hmm. outdoor amplifier theaters they have. And uh, he was a bit standoffish at the beginning. And, you know, mm. you get all these young bands that, you know, just have a fuck off attitude and yeah, yeah. Yeah. Whatever. So you kind of understand his, his uh, um, standoffishness, but um, at the end of the, the, the gig or at the end of our set, he came over to adjust mics and he's like, that was outstanding. And like, it completely changed his mannerisms. And I thought, huh, we actually <laughs> did. You know, we are, we're actually playing pretty well. Um, mm. But yeah, to build up, I mean, build up to that point, uh, a lot of a lot of prep work, uh, you know, just going over the, the material over and over, slowing it down, um, you know, just just uh, bar by bar. I, I, I typically use Reaper, um, and I'll, I'll put the song in there, and I'll just loop one section, you know, half speed it, really to work out what the person's playing. Cause this, this was none of my um, material. This is all pre-written. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we didn't you end have to up. learn it. Yeah. You know, we started to write, but we didn't actually record anything where, with me in the band. So um, I think it's a six, five or six song EP with a couple of other songs that we played. Um, yeah. And then you know, we did that gig and then we played a string of gigs in New Hampshire. And then we did a couple in mass and then, uh, 
we did a Battle of the Bands down in Haverhill, Mass, and we ended up winning that. So uh, that got us on on radio, and then we got another uh, the same same uh, same venue that we uh, opened up the Tantric. We actually got offered um, a spot to open up for Lynch Mob, so mm -hmm. that that was incredible. Um, wow. Unfortunately, a week before, you know, a couple of the members had an argument, and that didn't happen. So the gig was amazing. I just didn't play. You know, I went oh, to. The that's gig. such a shame. I, yeah, it was a shame, but you know, it it, it was still um, a really um, you know really great experience to be offered stuff like that just just based on your performance the previous time. So that's so cool. I mean, that's really interesting to to hear. I've been in similar situations, and some things that aren't really talked about are these kind of tensions in in bands and. Everyone's got some musical differences is the, the common phrase that's thrown out. But uh, I mean, right. it does happen. People drift apart and, and, but like, are you able to talk a bit about what kind of incidents were going on? What, what, what kind of um, fell apart? Was it a musical thing or was it just a personal yeah, kind of it was thing? A personality clash. Um, right. I, you know, I won't go too much into details for that, but you know, it, it was basically a very strong personality in the band and someone who was, um, not maybe not so strong, and the, there was just a lot of clashing between those two members, and it all came to a head one evening at practice. They started a, a you know, when I, there was an argument, and you know, I basically what ended up happening is I decided, uh, well, he he did the the uh, the let, let's say that the the one who's not quite as strong willed or a stronger personality decided he didn't want to be in the band anymore, which is you know fair enough. And I decided I didn't want to be around that kind of, uh, you know, that kind of environment. You know, it wasn't, it was, it, it made it not fun anymore. Um, yeah. You know, the, the, the music and the, and the players in the band were, you know, the, the, cre the creative aspect was really, really good. And it would have, it had, had the uh, personalities, you know, been worked out, you know, you know, beforehand and, you know, in a healthy way, then I think that band would have gone really well. But unfortunately, that wasn't the case. Um, it's amazing how much that gets in the way. Like, uh, it's so common. I remember, I think Bon, even, you know, high profile Bon Jovi were on hiatus for like 10, <laughs> 10 years or something because they all fell out. And right. um, it's just interesting. And they obviously were a big, big name at the time. So that's, that's crazy. And these bands go through this. But I don't think people appreciate sometimes how difficult it is to balance all these different things and people are coming from different backgrounds, different perspectives, both musically and personally. And you've got people, like you say, that are strong headed, that have a clear direction and sense of what they want. And it's hard for them to compromise sometimes. And it, it's, it's just, it's hard to get these things to work. And you've got all these other tensions and you're not, you know, at the start, you're not getting paid for it. And all these things that are come in and people have different amount of dedication they can give to things. So it's hard. I find it very, it's, it's one of the harder aspects of playing in a band that isn't really talked about too much, especially in more of the underground scene. It's, it's kind of uh, neglected a little bit. I think it's, um, I mean, if you think about it, it's a, it's a marriage between, it's the equivalent of a marriage between three, four, five people. You of know, course you, it is. A marriage itself is hard enough, but then you add several other people to, to the mix <laughs> and you, you know, it's, it's almost, you're asking for trouble. So I think the foundation of having, a band where you respect everybody and um, you know, there's something I talk about on my podcast as well is, is just having band agreements. Um, mm -hmm. And it doesn't necessarily have to be something in right writing. Although, you know, if you do end up getting successful and there's money, you know, that's, that's spread around, you know, it, what happens to that money is very important thing to write down and split out and say what you're going to do. But I think just the basics of, of being respectful to each other, knowing each other's boundaries up front, um, is is a really important thing to start with up front because you know you, you get into the situation and, and you know things are said and, and people don't you know react very well to high pressure environments sometimes and, and it all goes to shit. Yeah, because you make assumptions, don't you? You you. I mean, I've been guilty of this. You make assumptions that everyone's on the same wavelength as you and then you hit a certain situation and it just throws everything off on a tangent. And you're like, whoa. And I mean, I'm always in that stage at the start where I'm like, right, 
if we do make a success of this, we're going to split everything equally. It's always been that way, whatever I've worked in. And it's just always important to get that out open in the air. No kind of prejudice, just this is what it is. This is what we're going to do. What do people want from it? Let's have a good chat for maybe, you know, a couple of sessions to just try and see what we all want. And I think that's really important. So let's talk about about your your podcast. And uh, the premise of it is just people writing and recording music and that kind of thing. And you interview people. Can you give us kind of a synopsis as in, in your words as to, to entice people to come and check your stuff out and what that's about? Sure. Um, well, I mean, the, the impetus of it was actually from meeting other bands uh, while I was playing with Angry Octopus. And, Mm -hmm. um, you know, a fair few of them were kind of my age or a little bit younger. And the general consensus I kept hearing was you can't make money with music because of streaming. So Mm -hmm. prior to that, um, I started looking into, um, you know, self-help, not really self-help, but uh, mindset books, entrepreneurship, um, things like that. And, and I'd be hearing all these different uh, concepts and ways of, of changing your mindset about things. And so I, I tried to figure out how to um, promote the entrepreneurial mindset to musicians that are trying to, you know, do something a little more than just the, um, you know, the weekend warrior and just playing down the pub and yeah. um, actually be able to make, you know, either a living or at least, you know, have the band or the music be more um, self-sufficient. Um, so, yeah, the premise basically is is just that. I interview uh, musicians, entrepreneurs about their successes, their, um, you know, their strategies, overcoming failures. Um, and, you know, I get to know about their history of music, what music means, um, you know, what they've been up to, what their plans are. Um, and I, I be, because um, mental health is important to me as well, I do delve into that because I think that does uh, play into mindset a lot as well. And also, I, I don't necessarily think that maybe creatives are um, more susceptible to mental health. I definitely think we are, creatives are more um, prone to kind of display it, make it more public. Mm -hmm. Um, It may have more tools to deal with it, whereas someone who's more analytical and engineering um, may not be able to uh, express it. So it might be just that creatives tend to be able to display it and you don't hear from, you know, more mathematical minded people as much, which may be a problem unto itself, but, um, you know, mental health is definitely something that's evident in the creative community. So I, and, and like I said, I've suffered from, from it too. So I, I just want to be able to reduce stigma, um, make sure people know that they're not alone, that it's okay not to be okay and that there's help out there. So that's, that's quite an important part of the podcast, but yeah, general, generally mindset is the mindset um, around music is kind of the gen, the main premise of it. That's interesting and so important. I think we need to talk about that sort of stuff more. It came to light more recently when I was in, interviewing the band David Wax Museum, um, an Americana band. They came up and did a, a festival slot here in Calgary for the mm-hmm. Calgary Folk Fest, kind of Winterfest. And Suze from David Wax Museum um, is bipolar and she was talking about the problems and issues she had being on the road and being at home. And she said it's actually easier on the road for her because they have a very regimented way of doing things. They have kids with them, but they kind of know what they're doing. They're doing, you know, sound check. They go and play the gig and they're in bed by, what, you know, 11, 12, kind of all done. And it's kind of when they come home, it's a bit more sporadic and all over the place. But she found it's most difficult when they're kind of transitioning between the two segments. So... I, I think it's right. I think that artists and musicians tend to be more vocal and upfront about these things as a general thing, but I think there's still work to be done. So good mm. on you for starting a slightly different stance kind of podcast because I think there's a lot of general music ones out there and talking about mental health and getting people's perspective on that is is really important. Um, I, I think it's, it's so cool to, to actually do that. So do you actually, do you cover any kind of 
guitar tips? Do you focus on guitar? Or is it just music in general? Um, I, I, so I try not to get too guitar nerdy because it's not mm. a guitar focused, um, you know, podcast. But that being said, I've had you know a good amount of guitar players, yourself included, on there. Mm-hmm. Um, actually, at the time of this recording, I haven't released yours yet, but um, you know, favorite ones are um, Mika Tiska, who's Mr. Fastfinger. Who, if mm-hmm. you're into that, she's he's a Finnish guitar player. He's you know, I one of my favorite guitar players out there. Uh, you know, with the exception of Satch and and, uh, and uh, Paul Gilbert, he's you know really out there and one of my favorite players. Um, Brian Bella from the Aristocrats. Um, mm-hmm. And that was a really cool interview. Um, yeah, just, just, there's been a few. Oh, um, Mike Abdel, who's the touring guitar player from Fate's Warning, was nice enough to come on, on the podcast wow. as well. So cool. that did get a bit nerdy. Um, but yeah, a- anytime there's a guitar player, it's going to get guitar nerdy. So, um, you know, it's just the nature of the beast. So okay, to, cool. Tips, tips concern, not really. We do, we do talk a little bit about, you know, the setup and, and studio stuff. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. feel like covering a little bit of technology here and there because, you know, musicians do listen to my podcast, so. Yeah, it's hard to put a big, you know, a mix of stuff, but I guess yours is focused on a different avenue. So, but I guess as a guitar player, because mine's more focused in that way, do you have like a top tip that you either get sick of telling people or what's the most important thing if someone you have to kind of give someone like a minute of inspiration playing guitar what would you say to them well, if, I, if i give a couple um yeah since you're familiar with the satch tapes i would say you know wash your hair every day because i've noticed <laughs> that if i'm in the middle of a solo and my hair comes down and hits a harmonic point you know yeah. if it's not clean it'll dull it but if it's nice and puffy and clean It'll ring out like a little bird in the springtime. Yeah, nice. Nigel Tafnell. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> I started a cover band actually, and we're called the New Original. So. <laughs> but anyway, um, seriously though, um, I the biggest thing I would say is you know I, I I've got a bunch of tips I could say, but um, listen like absolute minutest minutest detail. Because the difference between a good guitar player and a great guitar player, I feel, is their ability to, um, you know, really be able to play the absolute nuances of their vocabulary. You know, it's it's all very well being able to play the right note and the right timing, but when you get to that musical sentience level, that you 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 know you you're articulating so slightly differently because of the way your fingers of touching the string, you know, it's, it's all about really, really listening to those, you know, minute nuances that make you that much better of a player. It is definitely a thing that people miss. I think, especially muting certain fingers, playing in it's certain pick positions, types Mm -hmm. of attack angle, all these little things start to add up. And once you're through the beginner stages, that's what I started to focus on and made me into such a better player because you could play in a way that people wanted to hear. You know what I mean? So that right. makes such a difference. Uh, so what's next for you, Simon? What What have you got planned this year? I know you're going to be working on your podcast, but have you got any other passion projects that you're working on that people should know about? Um, yeah, so I've just... Um, last year I contributed four uh, guitar to four songs from uh, another British guy called James Dand. So that's... Mm-hmm. Um, it's called Empowerment Songs, and it's... Uh, James does... Um, you know, uh, does speaking engagements and he talks about mindset. It's really up my alley. Um, he's, nice. he's been featured on my podcast once. He's going to come on again soon. Um, and it's a, it's a triple CD that it's all about inspiring people to be better people and, and improving their life. Um, so that's coming out shortly. So I'm, I'm currently help, he, helping him with the marketing and, and doing a yep. bit from there. So hopefully we'll get to hear that soon. Um, as far as current projects, um, I've got a couple of ideas. Um, there's, there's a bunch of songs that we wrote as high school kids. Um, and if you go back to episode 10 of my podcast, you'll hear one dodgy recording from a tape player in high school. Um, so 
just just some songs reimagining those those just to get it out there and some uh, songs that i wrote a long time ago that kind of uh uh similar to that style um i've got a bunch of weird kind of lyrics that i've written over the over the years that i want to turn into just some kind of avant-garde metal electronic thing excuse me electronic thing um so that that's going to be one thing and then uh i've got a bunch of ideas that so so what i'd like to do is is feature a lot of the play the musicians on my podcast to do like a podcast album um i i haven't really thought it through that much yet but you know i'd like to take a few different guests and and put them together on a track and just nice. do a track at a time i think that would be a really interesting project um kind of i'm kind of looking to see if i can write something that's based on human emotion yeah. and, and human the human you know the human experience and, and have the songs kind of reflect that. Um, but again, I'm, I'm kind of spitballing on that idea. It's, it's very early stages. That's a cool idea. I did something similar over when we went to lockdown for COVID-19. Um, mm -hmm. I had a friend who runs a studio, amazing arranger, and he was like, uh, tempo 120, C major, 4-4, four, four, write me something. And then he arranged it into this awesome production. It was incredible. Like we had sax players, guitar players, drummers, pianists, singers, it was, the, the whole shebang was, was in there and it was, it was amazing. So I would definitely follow through on that idea because it's so cool. Yeah. It takes a lot of work. I mean, I didn't do the work, but I did my little, you know, guitar solo in C major and he used it. So it came out sure. really, really well. Um, but yeah, then, dude, definitely do that. Yeah. And then the other thing I'm working on right now is uh, my friend Bruce, who's, uh, if, if you listen to any of my podcast episodes, um, mm -hmm. His band Killbot Zero is the theme tune of theme music. Also, I've got his shirt on, Brucifer, <laughs> which is also a killer album. Um, I'm gonna when he starts writing the the next Brucifer album, I'm gonna be contributing guitar to that. And also nice. his other project with Tim Chimes, who's on one of my uh, episodes. Um, they've got a band called About Time, and. Mm -hmm. I'm currently working through the material to put guitar on that. Um, so I'd, I'd say uh, out of everything, the about time stuff is probably the most, um, it's the stuff that's going to be released the soonest, depending on, on their workloads and, and the vocalist. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just a case of, um, you know, putting guitar on different people's stuff and whatever comes up, you know, comes up and, and I'm, I'm happy to kind of contribute to, to whatever appears really. So how do you um, find those opportunities come about, Simon? I mean, my listeners would be interested to hear how you kind of go about getting that sort of well, well, work or projects. Or... Bruce and I have had a really long um, friendship. Um, I actually mm -hmm. met him on Mike Portnoy's website, one his forum, back when right. the forum was popular. And he was <laughs> looking for someone to design t-shirts. Um, and I listened to Killbot Zero and I became a massive fan of it. Um, so I've been doing artwork for him ever since. And, uh, you know, we've just kind of messed around with different ideas here and there. And his, you know, Tim is a good friend of his, you know, look, they, they're kind of living in the same area up in Ohio. And, you know, I've, I've become friends with Tim as well. And, uh, you know, those kind of things, um, just pop out because, Bruce and Tim are, are just so uh, busy writing different stuff for different projects that you know it's it's kind of easy to say hey can you send me some tracks I'd like to I'd like to throw some guitar on some stuff and they're just like yeah here, here's twenty tracks go nuts you know um, they're they're just ridiculously creative um, the the James out you know, the um, inner anthem stuff the uh, empowerment songs. Mm -hmm. um, James actually met, met my friend Alan, which is in episode 10. I, I talked about having, uh, you know, high school music. So Alan and I went to high school together and he, he was really instrumental in getting me into the, uh, entrepreneurial mindset, um, because he's very, he's a serial entrepreneur. He talks at like mindset and millionaire mindset kind of, uh, seminars. 
Um, yeah. And it, essentially, if it wasn't for his encouragement, I probably wouldn't have a podcast to begin with. Hmm. Um, but James met Alan at one of these big seminars and uh, Alan suggested getting in touch with me and you know that's how I ended up on that. Um, but I've, I found that just just going on social media and finding the people that align with my my mindset yeah. uh, through the podcast has really started to broaden my circle of, uh, of friends and, and acquaintances and just you know the more the more people the bigger my circle gets the more opportunities it, it you know it affords really. You, know, you just like have to it, put yourself out there. That's what I'm finding is just yeah. approach people. Don't worry about approaching people. The worst you can get is a no and who cares? So just, right. just put yourself yeah. out there. And, you know, and, and we, yeah. we, um, you know, we kind of, uh, got introduced through LinkedIn and, you yeah. know, it's, it, it's, it's great because especially, as I said, I, I have, or had, uh, um, you know, ang uh, social anxiety and, you know, going to a, a meetup or, or a seminar is very difficult when you're trying to start a conversation and, um, you know, having the internet and social media really breaks that barrier down. And I found, like I said, I found through my podcast, I've, you know, exponentially um, in, increased my circle of friends and, and, and people I've started working with. So, uh, you know, it's a huge win for me. No, it's great to hear. Well, Simon, it's been fantastic to have you on the show. Uh, a different insight, I think, to uh, people have on the show generally. Uh, definitely very on board with his podcast. And, and I was lucky enough to be interviewed on, on his show. And uh, yeah, it's fantastic. Keep doing what you're doing, Simon. And talking of inspiration and mindfulness, I'd love to get the show kind of finished off with an inspirational track that you've chosen. So if you can go ahead and introduce that track and we'll just close out the episode that way. Yeah. And th thank you so much for having me on your show. It's been, been a blast. No problem. Pleasure. Uh, yeah. So for my track, um, I'm going to go with the Paul Gilbert track. That's yes. okay. Um, Absolutely. So the track is at, well, it's actually a race of track and it's on their uh, um, technical difficulties album called technical difficulties. And the reason being is because for the longest time um, I've used Metal Doggy or Metal Dog in various forms as my uh, social media handles. And um, that stems from uh, Paul Gilbert's terrifying guitar trip, trip <laughs> video. And at the beginning he played the, ver the original version of uh, Technical Difficulties and it was called Metal Dog. So that's where I stole it from and I've used it for you know well over 20 years now. I wish, I wish I could play the whole thing, but, <laughs> but yeah, Technical Difficulties by Paul Gilbert. Amazing. Thanks so much, Simon. And uh, hopefully uh, you guys can like and subscribe to the content and please do check out Simon's podcast.